In this video, we're going to look at fatigue life relationships, which is to say how the number of cycles to failure varies with either the stress amplitude or strain amplitude of the cyclic loading. So in order to most appropriately characterize the fatigue life relationship, we need to know if there's measurable plastic deformation occurring. If there is, then it makes the most sense to consider the fatigue life in terms of the strain and the number of cycles to failure, and we'll see in a minute why that is. If there's not, it makes the most sense to consider the stress compared to the number of cycles to failure. Sometimes this is called SN, and the plots are called SN diagrams, but that's just meaning stress. And we will make these comparisons to the number of cycles to failure. So the variable for the number of cycles to failure is NF, and we're probably more interested actually though in the reversals to failure. So essentially how many uh, complete cycles does this go through? So, so this would be 2N in this case. So let's start with the relationship between the stress amplitude and the number of cycles to failure. So we've looked at this plot before, and this is showing the log of the stress amplitude compared to the number of cycles to failure. We're going to focus right now on the high cycle fatigue section, which is linear here in terms of this log log plot of stress and cycles to failure. We end up with this power law relationship where sigma a is the stress amplitude. This sigma f prime is the fatigue strength coefficient. Its value is related to the tensile strength of the material, and it's maybe on the order of one and a half to two times the tensile strength. This a here is the fatigue strength exponent, and it's typically on the order of about 0.05 to 0.12 for smooth samples. I'll point out that uh, I've written it here as negative A because that's how our textbook is doing it, but sometimes it is written as just uh, A, and then the value of A has the negative sign wrapped up in it. So as with all power law relationships that we look at, if we plot this, like it's shown here, on log log scale, we end up with a linear relationship, and the slope of that gives us A. We do need to note, though, that this is 2 times NF, and so we want to be careful with that when we're plotting our x-axis. We can now consider what's happening in terms of the strain. So if in the high cycle fatigue region all of the strain is elastic, we can rewrite that equation that we just had to be in terms of strain, in terms of stress. So if it's all elastic, then the stress and strain are related through Hooke's law. So we can write the stress amplitude is equal to the stress range divided by 2, and that's equal to the elastic strain range times the modulus divided by 2. And so we can essentially plug this back into the equation up here. So we end up now with a relationship that is going to let us predict the number of cycles to failure based on the elastic strain amplitude. And we have essentially uh, divided through here by the Young's modulus, and so we have a new uh, sort of prefactor here, which is that uh, fatigue strength coefficient now divided by the Young's modulus. And then we still have our same number of reversers, reversals to failure, and then the same fatigue strength exponent. So this is relating the strain to the number of cycles to failure in the case of elastic strain, which generally is the high cycle fatigue region. Now, let's consider what happens if we have plastic strain instead. Where the strain is plastic, instead of only elastic, we end up with this relationship. So this is 
the elastic strain amplitude with plastic strain. It's equal to the plastic strain range divided by 2. And the equation looks pretty similar, only now we have this fatigue ductility coefficient. And that's multiplied by the number of reversals to failure, uh, raised now to a different exponent here, b. And again, this sometimes is taken to be a positive exponent. And the values here range from about 0.4 to 0.75. So similarly, we see this power law relationship between the strain and the number of cycles to failure. The fatigue ductility coefficient, as we might expect, depends on the hardening behavior of the material as it undergoes plastic deformation. So let's take a look at how these two work together to determine the overall fatigue life as a function of the strain amplitude. So in total, because there is a contribution from elastic strain and plastic strain, we add these together. So we now have one complete expression that relates the, the strain amplitude to the number of cycles to failure with both the elastic contribution and the plastic contribution. Let's take a look at these together. So this plot is showing the strain amplitude on a log scale plotted versus 2NF also on a log scale. And the lines here represent the different contributions. So this line represents the elastic contribution here, and this line, this other line represents the plastic contribution. And what we observe is that the overall data here essentially follows one and then transitions to follow the other. So at high stresses, or high strains rather, at high strains and a small number of cycles, plastic strain is what dominates. And so this is what we called before the region of low cycle fatigue, where plastic deformation is important. Now, on the other hand, we have down here, we have smaller strains, we have a higher number of cycles to failure, and this is following more along the elastic strain region. And that was the region that we called high cycle fatigue, where the stress is more controlling what goes on because it's only elastic deformation. We can kind of put all these pieces together now and look at a stress-strain curve that would show cyclic loading and see where these different parameters come out in terms of the mean stress, stress amplitude, uh, strain range, strain amplitude, and so on. So this plot over here on the right, this is a stress strain curve and if we just kind of looked at this part right here this would look like elastic loading and then some plastic deformation instead this is cyclic loading because this is fatigue so it gets loaded and then it gets unloaded and it gets loaded and it gets unloaded and the region where the stress strain curve is linear corresponds to the elastic strain. So over that range right there, the deformation is linear. And then here we have the plastic deformation. And so this is the uh, elastic strain range. This is the plastic strain range. We see on here, this is the entire strain range and the strain amplitude. So we can sort of compare that over here to these little uh, shapes, and those are the hysteresis curves of loading. So when the curve is very narrow, it's almost all elastic with very little plastic deformation, whereas when the curve is very wide, there's a lot of plastic deformation as compared to the elastic. The stress ranges are also labeled on here. So down here is the minimum stress, 
the maximum stress. So we have the stress range and also the stress amplitude. Sigma m here indicates the mean stress and the mean strain. So just in terms of what the numbers might be, in terms of strain amplitudes and number of cycles to failure, let's look at an example based on that equation that we developed. So this example here uses this uh, fatigue coefficient 470 MPA, Young's modulus of 210 GPA, a value of A equal to 0.1, the ductility coefficient equal to 0.1, and a value of B equals to 0.5. And so here are the different strain amplitudes. So the strain per cycle versus the number of cycles, and showing the elastic contribution and the plastic contribution. And this is just the sum total of those two contributions. So that's what we would predict based purely on this function. So in this video, we have looked at how the, the fatigue life varies based on either the stress amplitude or the strain amplitude and the relationships with the number of cycles to failure which control those.